the thing is though, if you understand the concepts of dual factor, two factor training, right? This, this fitness fatigue model, the same model that works for throwers and power lifters and Olympic weightlifters work for CrossFitters. It just becomes way more complex. Cyclists. Anything. anything. For, for anything, right? You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. Missouri, man. We're in the Midwest. There's yeah. cicadas and dogs barking. We're out here in the country. Welcome to Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and I have Matt Reynolds. And today we're going to talk about some research we've been doing. We've been digging into the history of uh, of programming thought, and yeah. uh, found what we what one of one of the earlier pieces that we think is interesting, and we're going to talk about that. But first, it's time we talk about the whiskey of. It's not the week anymore. Of the year, or the year. It can't be the year, because my whiskey's not very good. I'm drinking tonight. What, do you, what is it? I'm drinking Talisker 10. I'm drinking Talisker because I felt like scotch tonight. Uh, I'm drinking it with a big ice cube, which is now mostly melted because it's hot outside. And we're smoking pipes. And so when I smoke a pipe, and, it, and I, like a, I tend to like an aromatic tobacco. I don't know nearly as much about tobacco as I do about, about whiskey. But when I smoke a pipe, I don't want a... I certainly don't want a really good whiskey, a really expensive whiskey, or right. and I typically don't want a very smoky whiskey. So Talisker is a kind of a medium range scotch. That Talisker ten is not too. It's intense. a space side scotch, right? Yeah, I think so. So it's not. It's not. You know, it's not like a big heavy peaty Isla or something. Um, and that's just it works okay with this. So the 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 tobacco I've got though is a pretty sweet tobacco. It's like a maple rum or something, and. Uh, so it just counterbalances. I'm always trying to counterbalance whatever I'm, if I'm smoking something, I want to drink something that's the opposite. I wouldn't want to have smoky drink and smoke. That doesn't make sense to me. Right. A little contrast. Yeah. If the it's salt the loses. Like smoked meat, like if I'm going to have smoked meat, I want a really sweet bourbon. Right. I don't want to. If the salt loses, it's savor, Matt. <laughs> Are you quoting the Bible to me <laughs> yeah. now? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. It, uh, what are you smoking? Uh, uh, I've got the 1792 uh, barrel proof. Oh, you're not smoking 1792 no, I'm drinking barrel proof. That. You're and drinking it's so good. It's a cheap bottle, and you can still find it sometimes. Nobody's written any articles about it in Wine Spectator yeah. or. Uh, yeah, I, I still see it here quite a bit. Yeah, it's it's really great. It's like the 69 proof, 65 no, proof. It's, it's up there. Yeah, yeah, it's 60 ish, I think. And it's it's really we tasty. Bought, we bought a barrel of that maybe. Three four years ago, a group that I'm with, and then people started in that. That's owned by Barton. Barton makes them. Barton is owned by Buffalo Trace, and they're in Bardstown. They actually lost a bunch of barrels. Uh, yeah, a year ago or so now. So, and also this past week, you guys probably saw Jim Beam lost a bunch of barrels, but it wasn't in Clermont. It was in one of their, I don't know, some of their one of their random places where they have some rick houses, fifty thousand barrels, land. and they burned and yeah. everything. It's awful. What, can you guys hear the cicadas? I know. I guarantee you, Trent can hear the cicadas. When oh he yeah, he can hear a rat licking lard though. Yeah. He's, so we're out on my back porch, and we're talking training theory. And what are you smoking? Iwin Rees Three Star Blue. What, uh, what kind? What kind of tobacco is it? Uh, they say it's aromatic, but man, not to my. It's a. It's more like a Virginia. Blend it's it's or like something. Burley and Virginia Flake with a little. It is. Perique and Latakia. Oh, so a little so Latakia. It's a little there. bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's real mild, well, well and tasty, balanced blend. Yeah, and <clears throat> we did a did a show. I don't know. At this point, it probably would have been about two and a half weeks ago, something like that, about the fitness fatigue model. Yep. And you were saying uh, that was the Keeley article, Keeley article right. that, that yep. we that we were talking about. Yep. Whether we referenced it or not, that's that's where that that talk came from. K I E L Y. And you said, it seems like I recollect. Um, uh, Zatsiorski talking about the two factor theory, and you're like, hmm, do you same thing? Do you have science and practice of strength training? And I've like hoarded everything I could find, and I've yeah, got so it all there's digitized. A, there's a side story there. So I, I've owned all these books, and then when I had strong, I would talk to my coaches, and they'd be like, oh, can I borrow 
Vladimir Zatsiorsky signed some practice of strength training? I'd say, sure, sure you can. I just paid eighty dollars for it and had to wait six well, weeks to get know, it. Wasn't, it was, well, I don't think it was that bad, but and and then I forgot who I've loaned all these books out to. So I don't. I'm going to have to go in and rebuy all these books because I don't have half of them now. But because you own when you own data storage, you had a scan shop. <laughs> I digitized you would, most you would everything. Digitize a lot of that stuff. So we we pull it up and I said, you know, I I read about dual factor theory, which, which was. Um, the way it's presented in Zasiorski's Science and Practice, as well as in SIF's uh, and Verkoshansky's Super Training book, is that it is a it is a different way to look at things compared to supercompensation. And supercompensation is really the most simple way to look at the SRA model. So the world has sort of ad- adopted SRA with supercompensation. Now, now the starting strength crew has differentiated and say, well, actually this adaptation thing doesn't supercompensation is not really what's happening. So, right. SRA and supercompensation are not the same thing, but in the general in the literature it's it's tended to to feel that same way and it's just that the, that SRA model basically says that the stress disrupts homeostasis. You recover from that stress and you recover to a to a base level of fitness or performance or strength higher than where you started. The problem with that is it kind of looks nice on paper, but probably doesn't really work that way. One, well, one, it's it's hard to measure. I think it I think it works that way, but you end up with multiple SRA cycles that overlap, and it gets weird. Yeah. So certainly after the like initial, all your recovery hasn't occurred before you train again. That's well, right. At, at least. Once you're out of the first six, eight weeks of, yep. of, a, of a basic LP. So in a basic LP, you train on Monday. It fatigues you. You recover on Tuesday. By Wednesday, you're ready to re- train again. And most of the fatigue or all of the fatigue that occurred on mon- from Monday's training has now dissipated. And, all, and you're left over with the positive effects from the training on right. Monday. That's the idea. And, so that, and that makes sense right up until you get to the point where you get to like week nine or week 10 or week 12 or out of LP and you start getting into a or, longer sort of or week nine of a block. Yeah. Or week nine, a block or DUP and all of your training occurs with a significant amount of fatigue present and that yeah. fitness and fatigue model. I don't know if I said this as I, I want to say this well on this podcast, maybe better than I did in the podcast several weeks ago is that the fitness fatigue model says that, that performance Anytime you train, there is there are positive effects from that that come from that training, and there are negative effects that come from the training. And your performance at that time, at this time right now, is the sum of the positive and negative effects from the training. Yep. And so when you peak an athlete under the dual factor thing, you want all the fatigue gone. And so you minimize the negatives, so you get as close as a complete actualization of their of fitness their potential of, or their potential athletic activity at that time. So yeah. hang, hang on, let's go back and set it there here. So if anybody cares, you can go look up Science and Practice of Strength Training by uh, Vladimir Zatsiorsky. It was in '95, uh, right? It was originally written in '95. Yeah, first editions in '95. We're looking at the '97 edition here, yeah, I think, which is what the I had. second. You can still buy the, still buy that on Amazon. And. Uh, Sif in uh, Super Training talks about this, but he uses he references Zatsiorsky. He does now. And, we, and, we don't and, know who's. It's not clear who's well, first. Right. Though. So yeah. So let, let's let's talk a little bit about about that. So so Sif, Mel Sif, who's who, who's been dead for a little while now, worked with uh, Verkoshansky, who was a coach for the Soviet team, and and Zatsiorsky, I believe, was the one of the head strength coaches. Now I, I could be wrong. But if I remember right, and, and I was, I was when I was talking to you about this earlier, we went back and looked it up, and my memory was pretty good with this stuff, even even in the year that it was published. So, so Zatsiorsky was a longtime coach for the Soviets, uh, in in before communism fell, and and so when he when communism fell, he came here. I think he taught it at Penn State, if I remember right, and uh, and he wrote the Science and Practice of Strength Training. Now, Super Training, which is a giant reference book about all things training and it's it's 
it's not put together real well, and it's very verbose. It's weird. It's kind of a weird book. It's, it's a. I mean, I enjoyed it when I remember reading it, and and kind of I don't, I'm one of, I'm a weirdo that likes that stuff. But I remember when I was first getting into it, and there wasn't the inter, I mean, there wasn't the internet like it is now. It was written originally in '93. The edition that I have here at home is from 2000. And so he references Zatziorski. Well, obviously, he didn't reference Zatziorski in 93 because there wasn't a Zatziorski in 93, or at least not in English. That Science and Practice, if I remember correctly, that book, I think, was originally written in Russian. Right. Yeah. And he came here and had it translated. And so there was a guy, his name was Bud Charniga, uh, or Charniga, or something like that. C-H-A-R-N-I-G-A. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know that Bud actually translated that book, but he translated a lot of the old Soviet sports reviews. So if you think about like our, what was our version of the um, Strength and Health magazine, the, right. the Bob Hoffman magazine, they had the science, the the Soviet sports review, and Bud uh, translated those for us, and we could start to see those. And as a matter of fact, that stuff, that this stuff, like Zasiorsky's book, and that those old translated texts uh, that Bud that Bud translated, like in the '90s and early 2000s, really. Um, influence like Louis Simmons at Westside Barbell and 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 what it, we now know as the conjugate method block training later Vladimir Shurin came in and wrote those books and so we were trying to just get into dig into the depths of like where who were the first guys to actually really start to identify like what this was because man I'm really interested in in the Soviets put so much effort into their sport program you know they put all this time and effort into sport and they put it into space. Like those were the those were two big kind of Cold War races for for them versus us. And uh, when communism fell, they were really decades beyond us. Um, we we sort of hit our peak from maybe sixty five to seventy two in the United States, and then we just we adopted Arthur Jones and Nautilus and just plateaued in our knowledge about strength training and programming theory. And this, and the Soviets continued to push hard until, until communism fell. So when when those those texts got translated, I remember reading those early, uh, well, when you know when I was a freshman in college, like ninety seven and and ninety eight, and and going into the catacombs of the library and digging through and finding these books and reading these things, I actually wrote some articles uh, in in <laughs> in early two thousands, like two thousand two thousand one, called dual factor hypertrophy training. When I wasn't into powerlifting yet, or I wasn't really into powerlifting, I was starting to ride a little bit and doing stuff for like bodybuilding.com. And it was based on, I, I, I remember talking about Zatsiorski's two factor theory. So, fitness fatigue model, dual factor theory, and two factor theory are all the same thing. So, if you hear any of those terms, that's the same thing. And the only difference between it and, the, and SRA is really that. That, that the fitness fatigue theory is saying, well, there, there are two things going on. There are two results or two effects from this training cycle. Some of, one is a, ne- is a negative effect, and one is a positive effect. The negative effect is what they call fatigue. The positive effect is fitness. We'll talk about the time there. Like they say, well, fitness, the fatigue doesn't last very long. It's, it's, high in, it's high in magnitude, but obviously like you're really tired after a workout, but it doesn't last very long. The fitness lasts longer, and so what you're trying to do is, and, and, and that the performance is the net between those two. Yep. And I think the SRA is basically taking away those two factors and just looks at the net. I think one of them is micro and the other is macro. I think, I think a workout, you're dealing with SRA. Okay, yep. And then the cumulative effect of two, three, four workouts and the stress in those, and then your sort attempt of to cycle. recovery contributes to building fatigue and then you have this whole dual factor thing happening sure. um i think I, I that's what i think's happening let's well, go to, let's go to this text here okay um first of all he defines a general generalized theories of training he says a theory of training is just a simple model that a coach would use to solve sports problems right and in in this case it's programming and by the way the crossfit games are coming and i follow some crossfit athletes a bunch of them in the last week have done mock CrossFit games. Right. A bunch of them. Yeah. Well, what's going on? I mean, they're programming. They're doing this whole. They're doing. They just did a mock meet. Right. They're gonna now. They're gonna let all their fatigue dissipate, 
and then they cross as much as they can, can. as yep. much as they can, and practice some skills here next in the next two weeks or sure. whatever. And then the CrossFit Games are coming up. Yeah. And so I've got we've got if you if you kind of know what you're looking for, you can see them using this dual factor programming idea. So this is the general theory that people use for any physical endeavor. Yeah. So throwing they, darts. That's right. Running. That's right. CrossFit games, late weightlifting, well, whatever. Well, the interesting thing to think about is the, the original guys that came up with this stuff and this style of training, it was really focused around the weightlifters on the Soviet team and the throwers, like the shot putters. Well, if, you, if you think about it, for the weightlifters, it's, okay, what, do we, what are we training for? Uh, the snatch and the clean and jerk. Or yep. if it was pre-72, it was the clean and press as well. So you're talking about a, a very few movements, right? What about if you're a shot putter? One. One movement. That's, that's it. We're just throwing shot. So what I like about this is is that on a simplicity scale, if we take things and we and we get we get away from the complexity and we make it as simple as possible, I don't know that you can understand it in any more simple terms than something like weightlifting, powerlifting, right. throwing. On the other end of the scale, on the other end of the the pendulum swing is CrossFit. Yeah, and I've always said like, while while certainly I have all sorts of problems with normal people doing CrossFit as a programmer, what a nightmare! Well, not I mean, or or what a challenge! What a really well, interesting, it, it like, is interesting. It, you're literally trying to get someone to be. It's not a jack of all trades, master of none. It's like a jack of all trades, and pretty damn good at yep. everything. Really good at everything. If you're going to win, yeah, they're going to have the best at anything. They're going to have. Potentially, they they might run a 10k. They might run. They're going to do lots of sprinting. They're going to swim. swim two they're going to bike. That's right. They might do. They might do precision uh, marksmanship shooting That's now right. at this That's point. Exactly right. Um, all kinds of gymnastic skills. Right. They max might. Effort, they might max effort strength, like snatch ladders, heavy as it could possibly throwing. go. That's Ugh. right. Any of that stuff. Um, but back to this. So, text. how do you program for that? Well, it's the the thing is though, if you understand the concepts of dual factor, two factor training, right? This this fitness fatigue model, the same model that works for throwers and power lifters and Olympic weightlifters work for crossfitters. It just becomes way more complex. Cyclists. Anything, anything. For for anything, right? And so now here's my question. What I said earlier, I wanna I want to get your opinion on this because I we haven't talked about this before we started recording is if we look at the SRA graph, what is known as the supercompensation graph. Which is the one theory factor. The single factor theory, yeah. right? Is that graph the middle of the fitness fatigue theory? So if you say, okay, well, is it mm. is it the same line as the net effect, the cumulative effect of the positives and the negatives the two of the two factors? Is it the same thing? Because, it, because I, my argument has always been that it's not that SRA is wrong. It's that it's a little bit probably too simple. And then if we actually understand, like, we, so we know if we do a workout that's, let's say it's a proper workout that disrupts homeostasis that is going to lead to a gain in strength. The goal is strength. And we do that on Monday. It, it, it really doesn't even matter how it, we don't even worry about advancement right now, about, like, how advanced of a lifter you are. And you train on Monday, and it's enough to disrupt homeostasis. You do that on Monday morning. On Monday night, could you make progress? No, nobody can. You're tired. You're more tired Monday night than you were when you racked the bar at the end of That's the session exactly Monday right. morning. So the, the, the peak or the, the bottom of the dip of the, of the fatigue, of the negative effects of training occur, I don't know, six hours, eight hours, ten hours, whatever, yep. after the workout itself, potentially the next day. And then you start to recover, and the recovery is pretty is pretty quick, right? Like it depend again, it depends on the magnitude of the workout and all those sorts of things. But you know, day two you feel better than you did. But like forty eight hours you feel after the workout you feel better than you did twenty four hours after the workout. Seventy two hours you feel better than you did at forty eight. The fatigue starts to dissipate. Now here's the next question: How long does it take to reach the apex? of the performance increase, of the positive effects of that same workout. So if you do that, we don't know, right? But we know no it's No more not, than 10 days. Okay, but it's it's also not, it's also probably not 12 hours. It ain't 12, it's somewhere between 24 yep. to hours to 10 days. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, 10 days is way outside. 
Right. Super advanced, super heavy workout or yeah. whatever, high stress workout. Somebody pulled 755. Right. Working up to a opener right. on, on Saturday for yes. a meet next Saturday. Now, the question is, is would fatigue outside of an absolute absurd workout, like doing Murph or running a marathon or like – or you've never done 10 sets of 10, and you do 10 sets of 10, outside of something that is like a novelty that you've never done before that's just absolutely insane, would the fatigue from a workout ever last 10 days? I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't think that, I don't think that happens. No, if you did, you got rhabdo, like you went nuts. Right. You're in the hospital. You're right? in bad You're shape. You're sand. So this, uh, this one factor theory, i got to keep dragging us back here. Okay, one factor. The one factor in the factor here is very specific. Yep. They think that there are depletable biological components That's in right. the body that are used up. That's right. So you train hard and you use up. We can think of a bunch of these that they could be. Glycogen, Glycogen ATP. Sodium, water, ATP, creatine. Oxygen. All of those things, right? right? Like this thing that happens in the mitochondria and the sarcoplasm, you, you in the recovery process then, you actually accumulate more of those things than you originally had. You end up with more water, more glycogen, more sodium, more creatine, more ATP, so that you super compensate. Yep. It's, and the idea is now you about, can do more work. The idea is thinking about you, you, you know to, to create a solution like a a super compensated so, solution of like sugar water, right? So you take sugar Fucking in cold water. You, you put it in cold water. Yeah, my next door Barry. He just he just loving that blower. He's just blowing off all that grass. It's set what time? It's Saturday night at 8.47 p.m. Super nice neighborhood. This guy doesn't pay somebody to mow his lawn. He's out here mowing his lawn. So th these, these guys using this one-factor model, they're trying to time their workouts. That's right. And try to peak. They're trying to hit that next workout when you've got the most glycogen, the That's most right. hemoglobin, the most ATP, That's whatever exactly right. the factor is. Now, I think... I believe this is incomplete. Zatsiorski thinks it's incomplete. Right. I think Matt Reynolds thinks it's incomplete. That's right. But I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's wrong either. It's I, think wrong. It, I think it's 100% true. Yeah. It's just one of the pieces of the pie. Yeah. Yeah. And it may, well, it, cre it makes the timing of the workouts be the thing that matters. I could and, see, uh, I mentioned darts a while ago. Yeah. I could see, um, I could see NRA, um, in, NRA high pirate rifle shooting. I could see darts. I could see accuracy sports adhering almost entirely to this. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Sure. Yeah, the problem that you get with this that they don't mention very much is that that the thing that they're focused on that depletes you of all of these substrates is the training. But what about the whiskey you had the night before? What about... It's right. July, and you mowed your lawn, and you sweat a half a gallon, right. and you lost four pounds of body weight, or a gallon, right? Like, those sort of things. And so the, one of the problems that you end up with is it becomes, outside of a super controlled environment with professional athletes who live on on the grounds, at you the feed U them their the, food. At the U.S. You, Olympic Training yeah, Center. Yeah, at the, at, the, at, the, at the, screw the U.S. Olympic Training Center, at, at an Olympic Training Center where it's actually professional athletes. By the way, Ben Bergeron the flies those girls out, and they live with him and his family That's right. up That's right. until the games. Yeah, which is probably the way it should be done. Yep. There's enough money riding on it at this point that it it, it, it matters, right? And it's why the programming has become so, um, so complex and so, like, honed in at this point with CrossFit. But... Yeah, so you, you, you saw this at work. So, but the problem is, is that we know for normal people, we don't do that. We don't train. Like today, I trained. And I trained, I trained my squat pretty heavy, and I trained my deadlift pretty heavy, and it's Saturday. And you were up way too late last night. Yeah, so night. I, had, we had a, I had kind of a family emergency, and everything's fine. But just a, and I had to run out late and take care of some stuff in town that I didn't know was going to hit me. And I, was up, I, was up, I didn't get home till 1 in the morning. So I slept decent, but not great. And then I and then my sleep schedule's off because everybody knows about me. I go to bed early and get up early. Well, now I went went to bed late, and then I got up later than normal. I think I woke up at seven forty five or something this morning. It's not normal for me, but went to bed at one. And I got up and I trained my squat heavy and I trained my deadlift heavy, and I trained my squat and deadlift heavy on Wednesday. 
And it's clearly there is fatigue that was still present in me this morning. When I got up this morning, took a shower, I was like, man, my back, my erectors, it wasn't like I had a back injury. It was like right. I could still feel fatigue in my erectors. Here we are on Saturday morning, three days later after my workout, three days ago, three days ago yep. I went up, I squatted high 400s, almost 500. I, I deadlifted 600, 585, and, and there were, I still had fatigue in my back. So then the question is, with the supercompensation model would have said that one factor theory would have said, hey, don't train today. That's right. You should wait till tomorrow or the next day to train because all of those all of those substrates, all of those things that you're waiting for to replenish have not fully replenished. Well, and this is the reason why we've argued this in the past. If that was actually the case, then what we would do to make progress on linear progression is instead of going Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I mean, we would start, let's say we do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, when you stop making progress, rather than training every 48 hours, you would just train every 72 hours. And then when that stopped working, you would just train every four days. And then you would train every five days. And you would train every six days. And you would train every seven days. Right now, all of a sudden, you get to the point where you're training once every 10 days because you're waiting right. to super compensate. You're waiting to make the super solution right. so that your body has, like, more sugar, more glycogen, more ATP, more creatine, more salt more you know so it has nothing to say about well maybe it does say something about hypertrophy like maybe to have more glycogen you need more muscle fibers maybe they need to be bigger maybe it does say something about that sure. but but it's incomplete well and here's and here's another thing right and listen i'm not a i'm not a physiologist i'm not, not a muscle physiologist but here's what we know is that th those things are stored in the sarcoplasm of a muscle cell it's the cytoplasm it's the storage compartment which is not the contractile tissue those are two different things right right so it, it, your muscles have the ability to reach out and and use those things like it obviously uses glycogen and obviously uses creatine and the, the atp cp system obviously uses sodium and right and electrolytes and those sort of things but but those things aren't specifically the contractile tissue of the actin and myosin that are contracting to create force production, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase force production, right? So it is just, it, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. It is, in fact, a single factor. Yep. That is another episode of Barbell Logic. We will be back on Thursday with part two, uh, where we'll dive deeper into the fit fat model. Make sure you check out the show notes. Head on over to barbellogic.com. And check out the show notes as we have dropped images of the graphs for the fitness fatigue model that Matt and Scott referenced throughout this episode. So if you're kind of confused about what's going on, if you haven't read Zatsiorski's book yet, then that's a good resource so you can follow along with the rest of the conversation. As always, if you have questions about this stuff or anything at all related to training or the various lifestyle topics we've covered on the show, then email those questions to questions that's with an S, at barbell-logic.com. And Matt and Scott will answer your question on one of the upcoming Q&A episodes. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe to our Friday Fives newsletter. You can do that by going to barbelllogic.com and then type in your name and your email address in the big box in the middle of the webpage. Go ahead and do that and get unique content, fresh lifting articles, hitting your mailbox every Friday. And of course, you can follow Barbell Logic on Instagram at barbell underscore logic. Until next time, good luck with your training. We'll see you on Thursday. Fuck.